Good morning, everybody. We're working on the slides because I'm not plugging in. So we'll get the slides um, set up. But as, as Raquel mentioned, um, my name's Sean B. Broom, web developer, um, STEM educator, and executive director for the nonprofit Web Girls Code, which I founded eight years ago. And we focus on giving girls and women superpowers through computer science. But with Web Girls Code, we focus on um, web development, app development, game design, and animation. And I also have a small web agency called JMB Designs, and we focus on website design and maintenance for small and startup businesses. And unless someone comes to us with a different platform, we only build in WordPress. Um, so I'm originally from California, and then did a seven-year stint in Hawaii. Then we came back to California. Then I moved to South Carolina. And according to my husband, I should claim South Carolina because I've been there longer, but I don't. But I tell everybody I'm West Coast born and bred and Southern fed. So that kind of covers all of that. Um, I am also a stage three colon cancer survivor. I'm actually going, actively going through chemotherapy. I have my next session on Monday. And WordCamp was supposed to be like my end of chemo celebration. But um, in June, I, the same week I had chemo, I, con I got COVID for the third time. So as a result, the doctors kind of say it was like a perfect storm. So I've developed what they call ataxia, where it can affect my balance and equilibrium. So I do have my handy cane just in case. Um, I need that. And so I'm going to kind of do my 90-second PSA of um, kind of my experience is that in December of 2022, there goes my cane, but December 2022, um, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. In January 16th of 2023, I had successful colon cancer surgery. It was localized, nothing had spread, um, but they did find some cancer cells in the lymph nodes next to the area. And so they prescribe what they call curative chemo. So I only have to get 12 sessions, I say only, but still, it's 12 sessions of chemo. Monday will be number 10, so I'll only have two more to go. So we're hoping everything goes well with that. So what you're really here for is to see what I'm gonna be talking to you about, about how you can use WordPress to change the world. Give me a second, because I wasn't planning on sharing. So, yeah. I can't see my notes now, but I will be okay. So what I'm going to talk about is basically how do you use WordPress? And the first thing I recommend is going to is starting your local community. So today I'm going to talk about how I started working with high school students and also how you can develop a curriculum. And we love volunteering. We love helping the community, but we also have to pay our bills. So I'm going to talk about how you can generate income with WordPress and teaching it in your community. So kind of how it started. So like I mentioned, my web agency um, pretty much builds in WordPress if we get any new clients. So having that experience, our local, we have a, what they call a, a community foundation, and things are getting a little jumpy here, but okay. We have what we call in our area a community foundation. So the Central Carolina Community Foundation, before pandemic, always hosted what they called table talks. And they would open it up to the community and then they would tell you, hey, host a table, bring in some community people and talk about the needs of the community. And as a result, if you felt at the end of that conversation, you had a viable, it's not me, you had a viable project, then you could actually apply for a grant and the community foundation would actually fund you fund that project so you could do it. So in 2022, they were still doing everything virtual and they had a table talk for our county. And so I was like, I already know what I wanna get my grant for, but I need to show my face. I need them to see, you know, I was on the meeting. And my original idea, I had talked to the nonprofit founder and we realized we have a lot of websites that list nonprofits, but there's no way for the nonprofits to collaborate, communicate, a lot of nonprofits were duplicating their efforts. So we're like, we can use WordPress. 
and create this amazing website for our local community. So I already was like, I already know what I'm going to do, but they need to see my face. So when they see the application, they'll be like, oh, she was at our meeting. During that conversation, there was a topic that kept coming up, and it was food insecurity. And I learned and I, things I didn't know, like people were like, oh, yeah, we have a community fridge, or we were at the park handing out boxes to families. And I'm like, I never heard of that in my, in my county because I have three grocery stores within walking distance. I can open my front door and literally see the parking lot of one of the grocery stores. So my mind never thought that there was, that was a big issue. We have a food bank. You know, for most people, it might be 30 to 45 minutes away. But I never thought it was a huge issue. So after I left that meeting, I wasn't very confident in the original project I wanted to apply for a grant for. And that just stuck in my head. I would be driving, and I would hear about, you know, think about those food insecurities. Then another conversation came to mind. So I'm on the advisory board for a high school, Ridgeview High School, for their career and technology department. And the computer science teachers asked me, they said, we're teaching our kids web design, but we don't really know the real world application of it. So then my brain was like, wait a minute. There's a community need. These teachers want to connect what they're teaching to something real world. I'll have their kids build a WordPress website that addresses the food insecurities in our community. So that gave birth to that gave birth to the Cancel Hunger Project. So the goal of the Cancer Hunger Project was to create a website so people who were dealing with food insecurity could go and find, instead of having maybe to drive 30, 40 minutes to the one food bank that we have, find in their local community where there might be food services, where there might be a community fridge. So we were going to create this website with a map for people to find what is close in their neighborhood. So one of the stories I want to tell about when you kind of think of these projects you can create, how it can affect um, your community. So I'm going to tell you about Wells. And Wells is amazing. So Wells came to Web Girls Code during the pandemic. Her mom found us on the internet. And um, during the pandemic, we were offering virtual um, coding camps. And after Wells literally from 2020 to 2022 took every single class that we offered, so we were depleted. She even did pilot programs for us. So her mom always said, well, if you ever need a volunteer, Wells is willing to volunteer. So when we got the grant for the Cancel Hunger Project, I reached out to the high school teachers and was like, hey, do you have anyone who might be willing to volunteer a couple of hours during the summer so we can at least get the software set up so when school starts, we can just start working on building the website? And I never heard a response back. So I'm driving, I'm like, wait a minute, Wells. Let me see if she'd be interested in learning. So she met me at a co-working space one day, and we took the next several hours. She would watch a tutorial. So she actually was the one who set up the database, uploaded the WordPress software, connected it to the database. She added some basic plugins. And when we were done, she was like, this is so cool. So I actually set up a separate website for her just to kind of play on. But keep in mind, Wells did all this right before she went into eighth grade. And the awesome thing about it is it really encouraged and built up her confidence because later her mom was like, she joined the robotics team, had no clue what it meant, but she joined the robotics team at her school. I think they actually went to nationals. And then she's taken computer science programs. One of the best things her mom ever told me was, she said, we had, until we met you, we had no idea Wells was interested in computer science. And then she said, then we had no idea she was really good at it. So that's some of the awesome things when you reach out to that local community, because now we've got someone who's getting ready to go, who's in high school now, and her, she loves everything in computer science. And she's even, like, was creating an app. She's like, yeah, me and my, no, a website. She's like, me and my friends are going to build a website so that people in the community who have clothes or something that they want to donate or exchange, they can do that within their particular neighborhood. So it's a really awesome thing. So the Cancel Hunger Project, my team were some amazing teachers. So we have Dr. Chagoba, Ms. Brown, and Ms. Walker. So what ended up happening when I was working with this high school 
We ended up with like, what is that, 45 students, which blew my mind. Um, we had the research team and their responsibility. We had the sophomores. They were supposed to find out what food services were already available and get all of that data, get all that information. And the seniors were responsible for locating where are their food deserts? And we need to alert other organizations about that. The marketing team, and um, if you want, I have a little bit of swag and some of the marketing material that you can find me and I can give that to you. But they created flyers, they created postcards, they created the logo. And I loved seeing how from their first iteration to the final logo, you know, just that transformation. And then our web team, I love all the kids, but the web team, that was my baby. These students were amazing. So they were actually the ones that built out the website. And what I love about it, towards the end of the school year, their teacher, Dr. Chagoba, came to me and he said, there were five, and two of them were female, and he said, the girls stood up and took the lead. They became the team leads, naturally, on that team. And one of them, Angela, was amazing because she was in charge of all the plugins. And she set up the map, and I told her, I said, I've never even set up a map on a WordPress website, so you've got that on me. And what you find is at the end of the year, the two girls came up to me, and Angela said, well, I kind of have a side business. Would WordPress be a good site to build it in? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then the other one, she came to me, and she said, well, I have some bad news. I'm like, what? She's like, I'm not coming back to the school next year. She's actually going to the governor's school for computer science in our state. And she's like, but I still want to work on the project. I'm like, I got you. I'll make sure that you, you're still a part of it. So again, you're seeing the little bit that you can kind of spread out. I always describe it like we're the spiders and you spin your web and then those that you teach continue to expand that web. So we had a launch day. My original goal, I was like, we're going to have it after school, invite all the families. And then you realize you're dealing with high school kids and they have crazy schedules. So we did a lunch day launch. But what was awesome was that was the first time all the students were together. And so the research team, even though they kind of had the heavy work in the beginning and nothing towards the end, they were able to see how their data was needed for us to even build the website. And the marketing team also saw how they needed the research team's information to be able to build the website. And of course, the web team, they could see how they, everything was intertwined, so it was awesome. Plus, the marketing team designed some really cool t-shirts, and the school actually just started where they have a print shop. So the school actually printed the shirts for us, so that was something pretty cool. And I love the QR code on the sleeve. I told them I'm going to steal that for my next t-shirt. I thought that was pretty awesome. So when you get a chance, I, originally I was like, oh, we can show it, but I'm not gonna, I, I don't want to mess with technology but so much. Go to cancelhungersc.com. This is phase one. So we had some specific MVPs that we wanted to deliver for phase one. And so the goal was to have the map and a page where people who were dealing with food insecurities could go there and locate ones in their area. Because we have a big county, we only narrowed it down in the beginning to about eight zip codes. Because I think it was like 20 something. I'm like, nah, we've got to do eight. And the second goal was to have a map where people could find out where are the food deserts in our community so that organizations can be more targeted with where they're offering their services. So definitely visit cancelhungersc.com. And you'll see, we've got things to work on, fave, icon, footer, all that fun stuff. But that's going to be phase two. And my goal with this project was to have it student-led. And I told the teachers that because the teachers kind of wanted to. I'm like, no, I want the students to be the ones to take this. So I rarely met with them in person. The web team, occasionally I would do like Q&A lunch during their lunch for 45 minutes in person and bring them pizza. And I think they were just there for the pizza. No, they were, they were great. They asked some awesome questions, but I just sent them the instructions. We had a working doc. Here's your tutorial. Go do it. Or we had a slide. I would have specific slides for each team. Here's what you got to go, go do. It. And these kids would do it. So get a chance, like I said, visit the website. So you're thinking, OK, that was a great story, Shambi. Great story. Thank you. Our hearts are all warm now. But you may be thinking, well, if I want to do this in my community, I want to teach WordPress, 
how in the world do I get started kind of getting into those places where I could do that? So most of my experience, I'll tell you, will be from an education standpoint. But this can apply if you're trying to go after, work with a nonprofit, work with corporate, what, whatever company you're trying to get into to say, hey, I can teach your people. Because the number one thing for me, and we all know this, if you're able to skill up, your income goes up. You can create generational wealth. And that's ultimately what I look at with my projects is I want people to see just how much this can change their life. So if you're dealing with education, if you have children in school, start with your teacher. You go on field trips, you have parent-teacher meetings. Don't do the hard sell. Don't hand out business cards. We're, we're about building relationships. And when they ask, so what do you do? Oh, well, I teach people WordPress. Trust me, depending on your area, I mean, we're in a very high computer science focused um, district, school district where my kids go. But still, the minute you say something about computer science, the teacher's like, I would love to. Or there might be some teachers here. You already have a full curriculum. And the school district says, we have computer science requirements from the state. And they're overwhelmed. And the minute a vendor can say, well, we can help you with that, trust me. They love it. So think of it also from that standpoint. Get on a school advisory board. It's so like I mentioned with Ridgeview High School. I'm on their advisory. I'm on an advisory board for about three or four different schools. It's mainly if education will be high school. Colleges may also have that. But what's awesome is they want to partner with the community. So even if you're not sure, you know, go to the directory, contact the computer science department and say, hey, do you guys have an advisory board? Or are you looking for some um, partners from the community to help your students with their computer science? And then virtually, so Twitter X or whatever it's called now, I call it Twitter X. Um, I found that's a great way to get a hold of, to connect with schools, specific teachers, school districts, engage, follow them and engage with their content. The district that my kids go to, the way I kind of got in was through Twitter, back in the good old days, was, um, and I was posting a pilot camp, and then I got a DM from someone from the district office. She's like, hey, we'd like to meet. I was like, okay, cool. And we've had a great relationship ever since. And attend district community events. Sometimes we think a school district, and it can be the same, again, with a nonprofit or another organization, that stuff they do might just be for them. You'd be surprised. You know, go to those community events, meet people in a more relaxed atmosphere, because, again, naturally you're going to start talking about what you do. So I recommend doing that. Volunteering. Hey, lots of volunteers here. Volunteering at events, you're going to meet all types of people, and those connections that you make are going to be amazing. So next thing you're thinking, OK, I know how to network. But what if I actually want to teach WordPress? I know how to do WordPress. How can I create a curriculum to be able to teach it to other people? So. I think about my introduction to WordPress was around 2008, don't quote me on the year, but who's familiar with Joomla, Zoops, Drupal? I was team Joomla, like I would fight you if you talk bad about Joomla. That's how much I was into Joomla. And one day, a lead contacted us and he's like, hey, do you maintain WordPress websites? Never heard of WordPress. And I looked it up and I'm like, oh, it's a content management system. Sure, we can handle it. So I told him, I said, well, we currently don't work with it, but we, you know, we deal with content management systems. So sure, our company can maintain it. And he's like, no, I don't think you can handle it. And I kind of got offended. Like, what do you mean I can't handle it? So that prompted me to do research on WordPress. I'm like, I'm learning WordPress because no one's ever telling me I can't handle something. So I learned WordPress. And then we started finding we were getting clients who already had WordPress sites, thought it was easy to set up, for, but they didn't know the basics. They would set something up, and it was OK. So they were contacting us to be able to at least set up their websites, make them look amazing, and they were going to self-maintain. So that experience for me when it comes to creating a curriculum was, what was the good, the bad, and the ugly when I was learning WordPress? Write those things down, because you know how to teach someone and know, don't do this, don't do that. And 
The next question to ask yourself is, have you ever trained someone else to build in WordPress? Sometimes we're training and teaching people, but we're not realizing if we put those notes down, you've got a curriculum of how to take someone who's a newbie and teach them WordPress. So use those two experiences to build a curriculum tailored to the age of the group you want to teach. So if you're teaching adults, it's kind of like still teaching kids in a way sometimes, <laughs> depending on their level. But think about who is your market? What level are they at? And trust me, with our web development camps, like our ones we've launched this year are called Mommy and Me, where we're taking a two-generational approach. And you sometimes think, well, it's an adult, they're gonna do, please, these kids, they know technology. Like we had the seven-year-old, which we, we start at eight, but they're like, she's a mature seven. I'm like, come on, you know, you can come. And first thing she walked in, is like, you're gonna teach us how to hack stuff? I'm like, no. And that's all she wanted to do the whole class. But mommy got stuck. And the seven-year-old is looking at her code like, you got to fix this, this, and this. So think about the age that you want to teach. And again, adults are just like kids when it comes to tech if they haven't been exposed to it. So I'm going to give a shout-out to Nyasha. Yeah, I'm giving you a shout-out. So I'm giving her a shout-out because it was because of her I actually created the first training module. So beginning of 2020, she came to us as an intern through her program, and I asked her, I'm like, do you know WordPress? She's like, no. Have you ever heard? No. And so I'm like, okay, so I've got to come up with a way to train her where I don't have to be there all the time to train her, but she can watch a video, go into the platform, and start learning. So that's how I created my initial training module. And for the most part, and some of you may see things you recognize, but for the most part, that's what I still use. I used it with the high school students. A copy paste, here you go. I used it with Wells, you know, an eighth grader. So again, go back to the basics and find those resources, tutorials that are already out there that align with the way you want someone to learn WordPress. Okay, so some tips to keep in mind. Decide before you ever start working on a curriculum what age group you want to work with. And again, teens and adults can work independently. Yes, you can teach WordPress to elementary students. To, um, quick example is that, again, during the pandemic, we had kids that went through every single one of our programs virtually. And they were like, okay, now what's next? I'm like, uh, we're, we don't have anything. So I would kind of, I was like, let me try WordPress. So the way we did the WordPress um, camp, the pilot camp, was we do our camps for four days, Monday through Thursday, for half a day. And the first day was just videos and getting them introduced to the dashboard. Second day, they actually got to log in. So I set up a test site. They got to log into the dashboard and kind of see the stuff they learned the first day. The last two days, their assignment was to create their own page. So the cool thing about it, these kids had already been through our HTML and CSS class, so they were learning how to use a web editor, but then they were also learning you can go into the code and customize things with the skills that you already learned. So you can teach it to elementary kids, but you have to know what's realistic and what they can handle. Don't micromanage. If you're dealing with teens and adults, allow them to take ownership of their learning. And that's why I love the training module. Because if you go through all of those videos, if you read all of those articles and implement it, you'll be able to handle it. And then make sure you clearly define your MVPs and learning goals, goals for students, no matter their age, because we've all been there. We get frustrated. We have blockers. But if they know what the end goal is, sometimes that can allow them to push through. Like I told Nye, I'm like, coding makes you cry. I mean, I'm just, it does. We've, you know, we've been there, and I now tell my mentees, when you get to that point, just take a break. But we've all been there. So if you're dealing, if you're teaching someone, and they clearly know, my goal is to get this page done, and you tell them, take a break and get back to it, that makes it much easier versus if you're just like, I'm going to teach you WordPress, and they don't really know, well, what am I, am I going to build a side? Am I just going to do, what am I going to learn? So be really specific with your initial goals. So again, you're like, okay, great. I can create a curriculum. 
I can do all this stuff in the community, but how in the world do I get paid? <laughs> so I'm going to go over the three ways um, that's worked for us, and I recommend um, grants, contracts. And again, I put schools, but that could be contracts with other non We work with nonprofits, you know, with, um, you know, other companies, and then, of course, doing your own classes and courses and camps. So our area in Columbia, South Carolina, is blessed to have a community foundation. And what that foundation does is donors give them their money, and they allow that foundation to maintain their donations and distribute them through the community to nonprofits and organizations that align with their mission. Our introduction to grants, we were totally like pay, you know, um, fee for service in the beginning with Web Girls Code. We would do a few fundraisers, but that's pretty much what we were. And during the pandemic, I got a phone call in 2020, and it's like, hey, this is so-and-so from Central Carolina Community Foundation, and I'm excited to let you know you've gotten a $2,500 grant from a local company. And I'm like, cool, we didn't apply for anything. And I'm like Googling, okay, is this real, you know, <laughs> while I'm on the phone with her. That was our first grant, and she said, because they like your mission. So I say that to say, if you're gonna do this as a business, I'm not telling you to become a nonprofit, but do the research. I was taught a lot about the benefits of being a nonprofit, and then see what grants are available, especially if you're gonna work with schools. I was at an event where someone at a school district was telling the business owner, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with One Million Cups, some towns have them, but it's kind of where you, you pay, there you go. Like you get like, I think it's six minutes to pitch. And then the rest of the time, it's kind of, the community's asking you questions, but they're to challenge you to make your business better. And he said, if you were a nonprofit to this business owner, because she focused on kids, he said, I could give you money right now. So you kind of have to learn, again, who's your market? You know, are you going to have more benefits if you're a nonprofit versus a for-profit? Do your research on that. Because I know plenty of people that serve the community that they don't have nonprofits. But my introduction was when I was getting ready to do my pitch competition, which got me the seed money for Web Girls Code, because I did win that. Um, I had to, they said, we can do a pre-pitch at One Million Cups. And a CFO from a company stands up, and he's like, why are you doing this as a nonprofit? I'm like, because I want to make money I mean <laughs> a lot of times we think nonprofit we think no money school districts our local children's museum which is very expensive they make lots of money he said the difference is what you do with the money at the end of the year so consider that and check to see if you have foundations or organizations that want to work with people who are working in the local community do your research there's tech grants think about your intended demographic there are lots of grants even if it's not tech but you're working with an underrepresented group in your community that you can get money for that. And the biggest thing I say, if you do receive a grant, like we got a grant for the Cancel Hunger Project, and it's funny because at the end I'm like, I gotta spend this money. So we're getting postcards, we're getting flyers. But be a good steward of the funds you receive because usually they'll ask you for an itemized list of how you spent the money. And what happens if you're a good steward, you're gonna usually be the first person they contact when they see an opportunity or they see they've gotten donor money that um, needs to be spent on your, um, on what you do. So contracts, we're all pretty much familiar with contracts. So the biggest thing I say is establish a relationship with whatever organization you're wanting to work with. And I'm not real big on like cold calls, cold emails. We've all been on LinkedIn, you know, all the DMs you get <laughs> from people that you're not soliciting. And I was actually in a conversation with a district official who was complaining about all the cold emails she was getting, but the difference was I was there in person with her, taking a tour of the district. I'm, I'm taking a tour of cubicles, but still, it was about showing interest in them. So work to, again, volunteering, going to community events, whatever organization you want to teach and work with, or even if you're trying to do this yourself, just to get your face out there. We all know how networking is, but find that local community that where you want to be. Um, something to keep in mind if you want to work with schools. This is pretty cool. So depending on your school district, schools will have a cap of what they can approve financially without going through a district office. But if you fall under that cap, they can usually pay you directly. 
So I believe um, in a school district, it's about like three grand. And after, after that, they have to go through the district. So just find out kind of what the regulations are if you're trying to get into a school to be able to teach WordPress. And then get to know the district personnel. Um, some of you may know or may not that school districts are always actively applying for grants and they may need outside vendors. So to give you an example, right before the pandemic, was contacted by a school district for a Zoom call and so it was me and some other vendors because they were applying for a grant to bring AI into their school district in 2020, but they didn't have the resources. So they reached out to outside vendors in the community to say, hey, give us a proposal we're gonna put it in this grant, and then if we get the money, then you've got guaranteed pay. Never heard back, found out they didn't get the grant. I got a phone call in the fall of last year. Well, not, sorry, not a phone call, an email from someone from the district. And she said, we'd like to meet with you. I was like, cool, you know, you guys, you know, do pretty good with things, so yeah. She said, we took your proposal from 2020, put it into another grant application that got approved. Can you still provide AI camps to our kids? Uh, yeah, totally can. So you never know. Two years later, they held on to that proposal. It got approved, and we did the summer camps um, this past year. We did three th ages, uh, grades three through five, and I was a little panicky about K through two. Like, how do you teach AI? To we had one, one little girl who was amazing was a rising kindergartner, which means she had not been to school yet. Now this school is a special school, it's a computer science infusion school, um, include immersive school, that's the word, immersive school. And I was so worried about the K through two, like I hired an extra person to be there, because I'm like, these kids are gonna be bouncing off the wall. And they were actually like so calm. And my instructors were like, they were better than the three through five kids. <laughs> but because we were out there in the community, we got that contract. And of course, there's classes, courses, and camps. So if you want to create a company and you want to do it yourself, think of how you can create virtual, in-person, or on-demand paid courses. Um, for example, most our goal now is most of our camps, we try to get donors to pay and provide scholarships to our students. And for the most part, we get that during the summer. We're a little different. We do mixed gender classes and it's like 50 bucks for a whole family. Like when we were virtual, it was like up to four people, 50 bucks. So that's not really an issue, but then some of our other camps are a bit more expensive. Um, so again, that's where your donations, um, fundraising comes in real handy because it, it, it makes such a difference when you can tell a family, you can come for free on a scholarship. And so keep that in mind. You can do um, in-person and, and after, so if you're dealing with education, after school. And even if you're dealing with like another nonprofit, you can offer after school. So we've done after school camp classes and um, with kids. And then you can even offer, you know, one-to-one -one virtual sessions, especially with adults. That might work better with their schedules where you're like, hey, we can do a one-on-one -on -one session. So those are some ways that you're able to get paid. And the biggest thing for me in this whole process is really thinking about what your community needs, how you can help. If you're watching the news, I'll give you, because this is another project hopefully we can do in 2024. During the pandemic, I was watching a news story about um, a um, indigenous, um, what do they call it? Someplace in Arizona. But they didn't have internet and the kids were struggling with school. And I came up with this great idea, and I was like, oh my goodness. And then I'm like, I want to go help them. And then I stopped, and I said, wait a minute. We have people in our community that don't have access to the internet. We have school districts. Like, I, I had to explain, like, I told my daughter, we went to a rural town. I'm like, not everyone has the resources you have. And so I was like, wait a minute. This idea that I'm like, oh, I need to reach out to this other school in Arizona what can I do in my neighborhood? And so that's the biggest thing when you think about how WordPress can change the world. Look at what skill you have and how you can offer that to someone else in your community. Because again, if you help someone skill up and they're able to then continue with it and increase their income, it's a benefit to everybody, their families and the community. So that's my biggest pitch. Look in your local area, see what you can do. And then of course, if there's a way for you to generate income, definitely do that because a lot of times we will be like give our give our time away for free 
but we still have to eat. So keep that in mind. So those are just some ways that WordPress, you can use WordPress to change the world. Thank you guys for, uh, I was just talking to her. I said, thank you guys. Thank you <laughs> for all that, um, for listening. And so are there any questions that anybody may have? Yes. Right, excellent question. The question was, if you're working with the school, how do you approach hosting? So in the case of the Cancel Hunger Project, we just paid for a separate hosting account um, as part of the grant. And then the goal was to continue to get grants to, to support that. And then what, and for the most part when teaching, I'll just host and give them access to it. And that seems to be easier because we haven't addressed, like, because I was looking into that, we haven't addressed that individual um, type hosting, but that's kind of the things that um, have worked for us so far. Does that help? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes? Uh, at the mic. Uh, my name's Courtney Robertson. I have been a contributor to the WordPress training team for about nine years. Um, we're in the process of overhauling the site. I would love to know how WordPress.org can better serve organizations like yours. Areas that are out of our scope is pursuing the grants and the funding, and absolutely that should be done. Areas that we might be able to help and support are things like getting the hosting kind of environments. Um, there are several organizations that provide that for us, for our needs as we're creating materials, and need those environments to create the materials, but also then, helping to solve, instead of you having to create the materials, um, providing with your insight some of the materials that you feel that you need, simplifying that, that type of overhead. So if you have any feedback or needs for WordPress.org, there are a few of us here that we would love to hear some of that information from you. Yeah, definitely. And I think really when reaching out with, to WordPress, especially when dealing with younger kids, if there was kind of like this template training module I think that would be awesome, but we'll talk. Okay, yes, sir. Um, there's a nationwide group called Women for Code. Mm -hmm. Now it's adults, professionals. I just wonder if there are any links with what you're doing. So, yeah, so actually a lot of those organizations were who I research before I actually um, started Web Girls Code. And the key with Web Girls Code and kind of where the story comes from is I was helping my daughter in her fourth grade class. and. Um, we were doing Google Sites at the time, and like the girls were just quiet. I would ask questions, and boys would be all over the place, and the girls would just, and I'm like, you guys are already two steps ahead. So my focus, too, is a lot of them, like you said, are for adults, or they'll say starting at age 12 or 16. We start at age 8. My thing was, we need elementary school kids to learn web development, because imagine what they could be by the time they're in high school. So I think that's kind of what makes the difference, is we started at an age that most people won't touch and these kids can handle it. So I think that's the difference. And um, we've never reached out or collaborated because again, my mindset is we want the little kids and we go up from there. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm William Jackson from Jacksonville, Florida. Thank you for saying that you want the little kids. Um, this year I've been asked to teach WordPress at an elementary school, a middle school and a high school. Um, I've been in the WordPress community for a while, and my wife and I have done some kids' camps and workshops. But what I want to know from you is, from your experience, how do you inspire and encourage the parents to get their children involved? Um, because we can you know, do a lot of projects, a lot of activities, but some cases we run into getting the parents excited about their children yeah. learning about this. So that was our challenge in the beginning, because my thought was, oh, our market is the kids, so we need to be on Snapchat. And then I realized, no, the market is the parents who make the decisions, but then we realized our market is the donors, because that's what we found. Parents can be excited, but maybe can't afford the camp, or don't have transport, or whatever it might be. So we now focus on getting donors to fund those scholarships, because when you can, a parent who's interested, or you go to a school, and you say, we've got a class of 20, we have scholarships, your kid can attend for free, they'll be full. And so that's kind of where we shifted our marketing is we're not trying to go after that individual family because that's a tough thing to be able to do. And we, we struggled with that for like the second year. But 
Try to get scholarships, get those things funded so that you can tell someone your kid can come for free. Even if it's just one or two kids and the rest have to pay, but you can, that one, you can, and that's what gets the parents interested, especially when they see their scholarships available. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I thought I saw another hand, I think. Okay, we got one more. For the little kids, the goal was just get them to create a page. So we said everything, we didn't go into the ins and outs of WordPress, and it was more so just getting them familiar with the um, page editor. And so that was where the curriculum was based, like, hey, here's what WordPress is, very basic level, you know, here's what, take a look at it yourself, go play a little bit, and now let's just make a page. So you kind of have to just narrow it down. And that was a good focus for them just to have that one singular thought is I'm making my own web page using this web editor. And they loved it because they could do more than if they just were coding it with HTML. So I would kind of just figure out what in WordPress you want them to learn and then focus on that singular thing. Well, thank you, everybody. So there's all of my contact information, Instagram, Twitter, X. If you want to watch the, the video I was playing in the beginning is on my Instagram. There is my LinkedIn. Feel free to email me. But thank you, everyone, for your time. <laughs>